It's the year 1977, and astronomers are stunned. They've just picked up a bizarre and really powerful radio signal coming from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The signal shockingly matches the frequency of neutral hydrogen. What's the big deal? This is the very frequency many astronomers believe might be used by extraterrestrial civilizations trying to communicate. Since then, the signal has become legendary in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, aka SETI, community. But what exactly was that mysterious signal? To understand this, let's go back to the 1970s when the Ohio State University Big Ear Radio Telescope was active. For more than two decades, from 1973 to 1995, it played a major role in the university's SETI program. By the way, it was the longest running SETI project in history. And in 1977, Big Ear detected something extraordinary, the WOW signal. This wasn't just any signal. It was a strong narrowband radio signal right near the important neutral hydrogen frequency. The Big Ear telescope might be gone now, but the mystery of the WOW signal still fascinates scientists today. Imagine this. You want to tell an extraterrestrial civilization about humans. How would you describe our average height? We can't use feet or inches because these units mean nothing to them. Even here on Earth, we don't all use the same measurements. To communicate with other civilizations, we need a universal way of conveying information. Luckily, the emission of light by matter comes from an electron jumping between quantum states in an atom. This process, governed by quantum mechanics, results in specific and fixed radiation frequencies and wavelengths no matter where you are in the universe. Since we believe the laws of physics are the same everywhere, these wavelengths are universal. This makes them a perfect standard of measurement that any civilization could understand. For example, on the Pioneer spacecraft's gold plaque, we used a particular wavelength as a unit of length to describe information about humans and the spacecraft's origin. So, if an extraterrestrial civilization wanted to talk to us, they could have used the frequency of the WOW signal. And that's pretty amazing. The signal lasted the entire 72 seconds that Big Ear was tuned in. A few days later, astronomer Jerry R. Amon was looking over the data when he spotted the unusual signal on a computer printout. He was so surprised that he wrote WOW next to it, and that's how the signal got its famous name. The signal also has another, not so exciting name, 6EQJ5. Some people thought it might be a hidden message, but it actually just shows how the signal's intensity changed over time. The WOW signal sparked all kinds of theories. Some people believed it was a sign of extraterrestrial life, while others were sure that it was some interference from human activities. There were those who believed it could be a natural phenomenon we didn't understand yet. New research seems to have finally solved the mystery, but there's one thing we'll talk about a bit later. First, let's get into detail. A team of scientists, led by Abel Mendez from the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo, revisited the mystery using data from the now-closed Arecibo Radio Telescope, collected between 2017 and 2020. These observations were similar to those made by Big Ear, but they had better sensitivity, resolution, and polarization measurements. Arecibo detected signals similar to the WOW signal, but there were some important differences. These signals were less intense and came from multiple locations, the scientists believe that these signals, including the original WOW signal, can be explained by natural events in space. Their theory sounds like this. The WOW signal was likely caused by a sudden brightening of hydrogen due to a strong, short-lived radiation source. It could be a magnetar flare or a soft gamma repeater, SGR. A magnetar is a neutron star with a way stronger magnetic field than ordinary neutron stars. And an SGR is an astronomical object which emits large bursts of gamma rays and X-rays at irregular intervals. In any case, such events are pretty rare and depend on very specific conditions. But they can cause hydrogen clouds to light up for short periods. According to the researchers, 
What Big Ear picked up in 1977 was one of those bright hydrogen clouds in its line of sight. The study suggests that the signal's rarity can be explained by the precise alignment needed between the radiation source, the hydrogen cloud, and the observer. It means that the WOW signal may actually be the first recorded instance of an astronomical maser flare in the hydrogen line. Now, in the 70s, we received a radio signal that lasted more than a minute, and to this day, no one knows what it was or where it was coming from. But now, a new theory has appeared. Could the mystery finally be solved? In 1977, at 11.16 p.m., a telescope in Ohio caught something very unusual in space. It was a super short radio signal, just 72 seconds long. The signal was so strong and weird that the scientist who found it wrote WOW in red ink next to it. That's why it's called the WOW signal. Now in space, hydrogen gas sometimes releases radio waves, a type of electromagnetic radiation. They emit at a specific frequency, which is like a unique signature for hydrogen gas. This helps us to find, identify, and study it. Thanks to this, we noticed that the WOW signal frequency came from the same place as this gas. But it's not like it helps much, because we still have no idea what emitted it. What's even stranger, the signal happened only once. Even though we tried really hard to hear it again, we never did. And without a repeat signal, it was impossible to tell what it was. It's hard for us to even get its precise location, because the signal was short-lived. After a certain distance, it's very hard to tell where different radio signals are coming from. And that's where the theory started. This particular frequency that the WOW signal was on is special. It's not crowded with a lot of other signals. It's like finding a quiet spot in a noisy room. Because there's not much interference or noise. So if you send a signal on this frequency really far, it won't get lost or distorted. And that's curious. Because it means that there might be a perfect place to send messages if we want to communicate with any extraterrestrial creatures out there. So, could it be that they're trying to contact us? Well, it's a real scientific possibility. No one knows for sure what caused the WOW signal. But if it was from something extraterrestrial, they definitely communicate not like we do. The signal looked nothing like a deliberate message. And that's weird that it happened only once. If it was little green people trying to contact us, it would be weird for them to only try once. But just in case, in 2012, on the 35th anniversary of the WOW signal, we decided to send out a bunch of messages toward certain stars. We used a special code to make sure any extraterrestrial creatures who got the messages would know they were from intelligent beings like us. Well, mostly intelligent. We even used a lot of power to make sure the messages could travel really far. Scientists have come up with lots of ideas about where the WOW signal might have come from, but none of them are widely agreed upon. We know for sure that it didn't come from anything on Earth. Earth noise can interfere sometimes, but this signal definitely came from outer space. There was also a theory that the signal might have bounced off some space junk and come back to Earth. But later, we realized that the requirements for that to happen were very unlikely. One potential idea is that the signal might have been caused by twinkling in space, like how stars twinkle in the sky. But even if that's true, it doesn't rule out the possibility that the signal was made by something artificial. Another idea is that it could have come from something spinning, like a lighthouse. Or maybe it was a signal that changed its frequency over time or it was just a one-time burst. It's been 50 years since a strange radio signal was caught. But recently, a new idea about its origin sparked up. Now, imagine a comet streaking through space, leaving a trail of gas behind it like a tail. This gas could be key to understanding the mysterious radio signal that caught astronomers' attention all those years ago. One of the astronomers looked at the WOW signal and thought it might be connected to a comet called 266P Christensen. Yeah, that's a mouthful. This comet is about 1,800 light years away. 
It wasn't known back in 1997 when the signal was first detected. But now, it could explain the strange radio waves. Comets can emit radio waves as they get closer to the sun. It's like the gases around them start buzzing with energy. This buzzing might be what the wow signal was all about. To test this theory, we used a radio telescope to listen for radio waves from other comets. We found that some comets did indeed emit radio waves at the same frequency as the wow signal. Then we pointed the telescopes at this particular comet as it passed through the same part of the sky where the wow signal was detected. The comet's radio waves could match up with the signal. And while the comet wasn't exactly in the same spot as the signal, it was close enough to feel like we were on to something here. It also might have been caused by hydrogen clouds from two comets, the ones we mentioned and another one called P-2008Y2. Who picks these names? But not everyone is convinced by that idea. Some say that the theory about two comets causing the signal doesn't add up because comets don't usually emit radio waves in the way needed to explain the wow signal. Also, the signal didn't repeat itself and only happened once, which is weird if it's really a comet. They spread out their gases over a large area, so the signal would have lingered longer. The telescope used to detect the signal should have picked it up twice in a short time span, but it didn't happen that way. Also, the comet wouldn't have moved out of the telescope's view so quickly. This shows that we need to learn more about how and why comets emit these radio waves, especially at the same frequency as the wow signal. There were also a lot of mysterious and interesting signals in space. Most of them come from natural events, like something called fast radio bursts. These bursts of energy are incredibly powerful and occur all over the sky, but their origins are still unclear. They last for only a fraction of a second. Maybe the telescope caught just a part of one of these bursts. There's also a strange signal we've been receiving since 2018. This one actually repeats every 22 minutes, but despite our efforts, we can't figure out where it's coming from. It started way back in 1988, and we've been investigating this mystery for 36 years now. At least here, we know the distance of the mysterious object sending the signals, a distant 15,000 light years away. Some speculate that these signals could be from extraterrestrial beings trying to communicate with us. However, we can't say for sure without solid evidence, so it remains speculative. Another explanation is a pulsar theory. Now, pulsars are neutron stars that emit beams of energy, similar to what we've been observing with the signals. However, the behavior of the signals doesn't perfectly align with what we know about pulsars. There's also the magnetar theory, suggesting that these signals could be coming from supercharged neutron stars called magnetars. Yet none of these theories fully explain the strange behavior of the signals. Maybe there's a new, undiscovered phenomenon in the universe. So even though comets are a possibility, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about the wow signal. We don't know what caused it, and we may never know. We don't even know if it came from deep space or from somewhere inside the solar system. In any case, even if the WOW signal had a natural cause, it doesn't mean that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. The study that talked about this also discussed a sun-like star that could be a great place to look for signs of technology from space. There are 14 more stars similar to our sun in space, although we're not totally sure about their brightness. This opens up exciting possibilities for hunting down signs of advanced civilizations beyond Earth. Ooh. We still can't find the source of the mysterious signal we've been receiving since 2018. We receive it every 22 minutes and nothing can explain this. Some scientists even believe it could be coming from another civilization we haven't met yet. This strange radio signal wasn't found by a scientist on a serious mission. It was actually discovered by a college student just doing a regular project for school. Tyrone O'Doherty 
an undergrad student at Curtin University in Australia, was sifting through old data of the southern sky. He was looking for any weird blinking radio signals. He finally stumbled upon one from 2018 that seemed to shoot radio waves towards Earth like a lighthouse beam. Excited about his find, Tyrone shared it with his mentor, radio astronomer Natasha Hurley Walker. She dove into researching this signal, hoping for a breakthrough. But despite checking different frequency data, they hit a dead end. But then, Natasha spotted a pattern. The signal repeated every 18 minutes. This was huge. But just as they were gearing up to study it further, poof, the signal vanished after only three months, leaving them with nothing. Not giving up, Natasha and her team scanned the skies again, desperate for a clue. Months passed, but nothing turned up. They were ready to give up, and then suddenly, a new signal popped up. This one kept blinking for five minutes, then it disappeared. And then it came back exactly 22 minutes later. The main question was if that signal was related to an 18-minute one. To figure it out, Natasha went back to the old radio data from that area. As they dug deeper, they realized that, yes, and these signals aren't anything new. They've been beaming towards Earth for 35 years. Back in 1988, Indian and American telescopes had caught them, but they got buried under tons of other data. This was great news for space explorers because it meant they could now calculate how far away this mysterious object was. After doing the math, they figured out it was incredibly far, even on a space scale. 15,000 light years from Earth. Now, the only thing left to uncover was what exactly this object was. Walker and his team started comparing it to all the known radio emitting objects out there. Yet, its source remains a mystery. The signals still pop up every 22 minutes on NASA screens, always ending with a frustrating match not found message. The scientists called it J183910. Some think that the signal might come from some extraterrestrial beings. Maybe it's the signal that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been waiting for. This project has been working for over 50 years, trying to find any evidence of life beyond Earth. They also scan the skies for radio waves, laser pulses, and other mysterious signals. So maybe it's a way for extraterrestrial folk to communicate their location. While that idea may sound exciting, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. First, we don't have solid proof for that. Before any concrete evidence, it's just speculation. And also, there are other more plausible explanations. Most likely, it comes from a natural phenomenon, and there are a couple of theories for that. The first one is the pulsar theory. Imagine a huge star in space much bigger than our sun. Sometimes, these big stars finish their life journeys in a spectacular event called a supernova. When this happens, the star's core collapses, becoming super compact, as if you're squeezing all the stuff from that star into a tiny space. That tiny, super-dense core is called a neutron star. Some of these neutron stars are extra special. We call them pulsars. They get their name because they seem to pulse with energy, like a space lighthouse. These pulsars have incredibly strong magnetic fields, much stronger than what you'd find on Earth. They're like enormous magnets in space. Because of this, they shoot out beams of energy. They're also spinning super fast, so these beams of energy seem to pulse on and off as they spin around. Now, the strange signal we detected seems to have similarities with pulsars, but not quite. Pulsars usually have a predictable lifespan and slow down over time eventually stopping their radio signals. In contrast, our mysterious signal is quite persistent and is blinking beyond what's expected for pulsars. So, maybe it's not a typical pulsar, or not a pulsar at all. There's also a magnetar theory. Now, a magnetar is another type of neutron star. They're like supercharged versions of pulsars, with even stronger magnetic fields and slightly longer pulsating periods. Maybe this is what causes our signal's intense persistence. However, when we plotted the data, 
We also realized the signal didn't match the magnetar's vibes either. Magnetars not only send out radio waves, but also powerful X-rays because they're so energetic. But the signal we received was only sending out radio waves. So we figured it's not a pulsar and not a magnetar. The signal's behavior is very strange and suggests an unnatural source. This means there might be something in the universe that scientists haven't fully explored yet. And there is a space object that we don't know much about. The final theory is the so-called dwarf pulsar. Sounds a little dopey to me. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Now, a dwarf pulsar is like a star that blinks with light flashes, similar to pulsars, but it takes longer for each blink. Usually, white dwarfs are the leftovers from smaller stars. They don't blink because their magnetic field isn't as strong as pulsars. But when a white dwarf becomes pretty hefty, almost the mass of our sun, it gets super dense and starts pulsating with a strong magnetic field, just like pulsars. They have a cool quirk. White dwarfs are made of electrons, not neutrons like pulsars. When these charged electrons start dancing with the magnetic field, they shoot out periodic light flashes, which happen every 100 to 1,000 seconds. As you remember, our signal has a period of 22 minutes, 1,320 seconds. A bit longer than the usual white dwarf pulsars, but it's much closer to the truth. So far, this sounds like the most plausible explanation. But even this theory isn't fully confirmed yet. This just shows how much there is in the universe that we're still figuring out. For example, fast radio bursts, another mysterious type of signal we've been detecting. They're like quick, intense bursts of energy in the form of radio waves. They have a ton of energy. FRBs are so powerful that sometimes they can be brighter than entire galaxies. Now, imagine this. They release as much energy in a few milliseconds as our sun does in three whole days. Wow! These bursts happen all over the sky with huge frequencies, although some have been detected with lower frequencies. Every day, we catch around 10,000 random FRBs in the sky. Some of them repeat, but most happen once and disappear forever. Unfortunately, most of them only last for a fraction of a second, and by the time their energy reaches us, it's a thousand times weaker than a mobile phone signal from the moon. This is why, despite their brightness, there's still a lot we don't understand about them. We're still trying to figure out what causes these FRBs. They could be coming from different sources, like already mentioned magnetars, colliding stars, or even merging galaxies or white dwarfs. As these bursts travel through space, they pick up information about the cosmic environments they pass through, like interstellar gas clouds. It's very unlikely that FRBs are some messages from extraterrestrial beings, though. Not only because there are thousands of them every day all across the sky, but also because we know that the sources of these bursts must be incredibly energetic themselves. Our neighbors would have to have equipment stronger than entire galaxies for that. But the bottom line is, while all these signals are fascinating, there's still a ton to learn about them. In the middle of the previous century, flying saucers were constantly making headlines. America was going through a surge of reported UFO sightings. So it shouldn't probably come as a surprise that the American authorities, namely the US Air Force, created a couple of short-lived programs. Those were Project Sign and Project Grudge, and their main goal was to look into that phenomenon. These programs were followed by likely the most famous of them all, Project Blue Book. It was a large-scale government study that lasted from 1951 to 1969. The initiator of this program was Major General Charles P. Cabell. He was a former intelligence director of the Air Force. Project Blue Book scrupulously gathered over 12,600 reports about people seeing bizarre unidentified objects in the sky. After thorough research, it was determined that most of those had natural, quite mundane explanations. 
As for the rest of the reports, the members of Project Blue Book simply didn't have enough data to evaluate them. That's why support for their efforts dwindled. Officially, Project Blue Book was closed in December 1969. But apparently, it didn't make American authorities lose interest in UFO sightings. Because in mid-December 2017, the world found out that they had secretly launched one more UFO research program in the late 2000s. Accordingly to certain documents, American authorities spent around $22 million over a four-year span on a project called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, aka AADIP. This project was started in 2007, and its main goal was to study UFO phenomena. Most likely, all this activity was triggered by the 2004 Tic Tac incident. That's when a few U.S. Air Force pilots spotted unidentified flying objects off the coast of California. They captured them on video. None of the pilots could figure out what these objects were. They behaved in a weird way, as if our laws of physics didn't apply to them. They were reportedly flying extremely fast and rotating in unpredictable movements. It looks as if after that incident, American authorities decided to investigate whether those objects could be identified or not. And if not, they were eager to know where they had come from and if they had been a threat. When the New York Times story about the new project broke, officials announced that the study had been terminated in 2012. Uh, however, there were people who claimed that the program was still ongoing. One of those was a military intelligence official running the program until they quit in October 2016. In any case, let's have a closer look at this mysterious program. Indeed, the areas of research funded by the project resembled things you could find in Star Trek. For example, one grant was for the study of traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. This study was conducted by Eric W. Davis of EarthTech International Inc. Another grant sponsored the research of invisibility cloaking. One more area of study included warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. This research was conducted by a theoretical physicist and director of the nonprofit Icarus Interstellar. As we've already mentioned, all these studies received at least $22 million of funding, but this sum could have been much bigger. No one has revealed why or how these studies were given such huge grants under the AATI program. The results of the study aren't known publicly either. The criteria for choosing these fields of research could be that warp drives and stargates might be useful for extraterrestrial civilizations traveling interstellar distances to visit our planet. Still, some people are not amused that such questionable fields of study were receiving substantial government funding. You must have heard that humans were supposed to fly to Mars within the next 10 to 20 years, but now the mission seems to be at risk. A new study has revealed the dramatic effects that such a journey can have on the human body, and because of that, the entire plan is now at risk. Samples from over 40 missions, which involve both mice and humans, have shown that the conditions in space are likely to have an even more negative influence on our bodies than we thought. Both NASA and SpaceX are planning to send crewed missions to Mars in the coming decades, but new findings might put an end to these projects. Researchers at University College London have discovered that microgravity and galactic radiation in space cause serious health risks, and they become more and more pressing the longer someone is exposed to these conditions. Surprisingly, the body part at the highest risk is the kidneys. The research has shown that after less than a month in space, some parts of the kidneys show visible signs of shrinking, so before we go all the way to Mars, we'll need to develop measures to protect the kidneys and other parts of the body. This will allow astronauts who'll take part of this mission to avoid irreversible damage to their health, which in turn means that future missions to Mars haven't been completely ruled out yet. The author of the study, Dr. Keith Sue, mentioned that they already knew about the issues that astronauts had after short space missions, like kidney stones, for example. But they still don't know why such problems occur or what is going to happen to astronauts on much longer space flights, such as the planned mission to Mars. If they don't manage to develop new methods to protect the kidneys, astronauts who will eventually reach the Red Planet might need serious kidney treatment already on their way back. Unfortunately, the effects of radiation damage on kidneys appear pretty late. By the time they become apparent, it might be too late to prevent a kidney failure. 
this can be catastrophic, not only for the astronauts, but also for the entire mission's chances of success. Meanwhile, an astronaut on Mars is likely to receive up to 700 more daily radiation doses than those we get on our home planet. The Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere protect people from the non-stop bombardment of cosmic rays. These energetic particles travel close to the speed of light and can easily penetrate the human body. In space, astronauts aren't protected against this radiation as effectively as on Earth, which can increase the risk of many serious health issues during long missions. Damage to the human body can extend to the brain, heart, eyes and central nervous system. Physicists studying cosmic radiation explain that one day in space is equivalent to the amount of radiation one receives on Earth for a whole year. Moreover, most of the changes in the genes of the astronauts are likely to be the result of radiation exposure. That's what a recent NASA's twin study claims. It has shown DNA damage in astronaut Scott Kelly compared to his identical twin and fellow astronaut Mark Kelly, who remained on our planet. Another source of space radiation are the unpredictable solar particle events. They deliver high doses of radiation in short periods of time, which can lead to radiation sickness if astronauts don't take special protective measures. Even space flights orbiting close to the Earth, including the International Space Station, have highly adverse health effects. These days, research communities are focused on musculoskeletal, neurological, ocular and cardiovascular degeneration, and these issues can appear as soon as a few weeks into a mission. At the same time, the effects of low Earth orbit flies are less clear when we talk about other organs. More research is definitely needed. Voyager 1, which has been traveling through interstellar space for more than 45 years and is trailing a long gray beard by this time, nah, not really. It suddenly began to send strange signals to Earth. Even more bizarre, there are no signs that the probe has broken or anything. Scientists from NASA are desperately trying to find the reason. So what's happened exactly? First of all, let me tell you a bit more about Voyager 1 and its long, long journey. Voyager 1 is an American space probe. Scientists from NASA sent it into space on September 5, 1977. Voyager's goal was to explore the outer planets of our solar system, namely Jupiter and Saturn. Initially, scientists assumed that the mission would take about five years. Haha, <laughs> the joke's on them. The probe exceeded all expectations. Not only did it fulfill its mission, but it's still working for much longer than expected. Voyager 1 has been wandering around space for more than 45 years. It's hard to estimate what Voyager 1 has done for science. Firstly, it successfully sent a lot of photos of Jupiter and Saturn to Earth. By the way, you can even check out these photos yourself. All of them are published on the NASA website. Thanks to Voyager, we also discovered several new moons of Jupiter and a previously unknown system of its rings. We learned that Jupiter's famous red spot is actually a giant superfast storm. And after leaving Neptune's orbit behind, Voyager also sent a lot of important data about interstellar plasma. So Voyager 1 successfully proved to scientists how useful it was. After that, it happily headed for its next goal, the Kuiper Belt and the Heliosphere. The Kuiper Belt is a ring of icy bodies that extends from Neptune to a distance of approximately 50 AU from the Sun. It's kind of similar to the asteroid belt, but about 20 times wider and 100 times heavier. And the heliosphere is an area around the Sun where the pressure of the solar wind is balanced with the pressure of interstellar gas. Yeah, I know, it sounds like some hard scientific stuff. Just keep in mind that this data really helps us understand the universe as a whole. So this is Voyager's last task to tell us more about interstellar space. The probe has already sent us more than 60 frames for a mosaic of the solar system from a distance of over 4 billion miles from Earth. Scientists use these frames to make a big colored picture. The photo was called the pale blue dot. And you've probably already guessed what that dot is. Yep, that's what our Earth looks like through Voyager's eyes. This photo clearly shows how tiny we really are and how precious and fragile our planet is. But Voyager 1 also has another, even more important mission, to tell other civilizations about us humans. You might have heard about the famous Voyager Golden Records. People created many audio and video files and added them to these records. There are a few sections. The first one contains hello in 55 languages, including ancient and extinct ones. Almost 80% of the recordings are different musical pieces, like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Stravinsky. 
folk music from different countries and ages, and a bit of the blues, like famous songs by Louis Armstrong and Chuck Berry. The remaining 20% of the recordings contain different human voices, sounds of nature and animals, as well as 116 images encoded as audio signals. There's also recordings of speeches by Kurt Waldheim, a former UN Secretary General, and Jimmy Carter, a former US President. These are just some friendly messages. In addition to the records, scientists also packed a needle for playing them. Don't worry, they also left a simple drawing that showed how to use all this stuff and how to translate the sounds into pictures. They added Earth's coordinates, which they created using a pulsar map. It shows the position of the Sun in the Milky Way. The record was packed in an aluminum case and covered with gold to protect it against radiation and cosmic dust. Carrying this record, Voyager 1 set off on its long journey. And it has already traveled quite a distance, I'd say. Right now, Voyager 1 is 154 astronomical units away from us. That's about 14.5 billion miles. This makes it the most remote human-made object. Initially, this title belonged to the Pioneer 10 mission, but Voyager overtook it in 1998. What a bargain for NASA! It's way beyond its Best Buy date. Voyager 1 is actually so cool that it even overtook its twin brother, Voyager 2, which, by the way, had been sent into space two weeks earlier. Voyager 1 moves at a speed of 9.7 miles per second. That's 35,000 miles per hour. Even the fastest sports car in the world travels at a speed of only 305 miles per hour. So it's hard to imagine the speed of Voyager. Anyway, at the moort, Voyager is heading to the borders of the Oort cloud. That's the name of a hypothetical layer of icy objects surrounding the solar system. Astronomers haven't confirmed its existence yet, but they're almost sure it's there. After all, even black holes were only a theory not so long ago. Unfortunately, Voyager 1 won't return back to the solar system. It'll keep in touch with Earth at least until 2025. But eventually, we'll lose the connection with it for good. In 300 years, it'll reach the borders of the Oort cloud. And in 30,000 years, I won't be around then, it'll finally leave the solar system. And if nothing happens to it along the way, in another 10,000 years, Voyager 1 will approach red dwarf star Gliese 445 in the giraffe constellation. In the future, the probe will probably keep wandering around the Milky Way galaxy. And now, let's finally discuss the mysterious signals part. So, what happened? Well, a rather unusual thing. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which monitors and controls both Voyagers, reported this problem in May 2022. Our veteran spacecraft suddenly began sending strange data to Earth. The whole situation puzzles even engineers from NASA. Now, I bet you're thinking, ah, oh, come on, the thing just probably broke down or something. But the truth is that Voyager 1 is totally fine. It works as usual, receives and carries out commands from Earth, and collects and sends scientific data. But the readings of the AACS, which stands for Attitude and Articulation Control Subsystem, don't show what is actually happening to Voyager anymore. The system supports the orientation of the probe in space and helps it keep in touch with Earth. So, basically, the signals mean that the probe's orientation in space is messed up. But scientists claim this is not the case. They know that the source of the antenna signal remains in the same position relative to Earth as planned. The problem hasn't triggered any of the onboard fault protection systems. The probe hasn't even entered safe mode. So what in the world, or universe, is going on? Suzanne Dodd, the head of the project, says that the problem is not actually that unexpected. After all, Voyager 1 is already 45 years old. The expert admits that what's happening to the probe remains a mystery to them. They don't know exactly where the incorrect data is coming from, and it's unclear how this will affect the operation of Voyager. She adds, though, that it's not that surprising, considering that the probe is in interstellar space. There's a very high level of radiation there. No spacecraft has ever reached that point before. Scientists from NASA say they'll keep closely monitoring the data coming from Voyager 1 until they figure out the problem. If they find it, the management team will try to fix it. Otherwise, the team will have to adapt to the new conditions. It might not be enough just to understand the problem, though. 
It takes as much as 20 hours and 33 minutes to receive the signal from Voyager. And it takes the same amount of time to respond to it. Well, at least the second spacecraft, Voyager 2, is totally fine. Even though it's also currently in interstellar space at a distance of 12 billion miles from Earth. Anyway, we can only wait for news and hope that the problem will be resolved. I actually wonder how much longer can Voyager 1 last? Will it be able to fly to the borders of the Oort cloud in 300 years? What do you think? I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. All the planets of the solar system are slowly lining up. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune are about to form a straight line. This event, called the Parade of Planets, occurs once every 176 years. The last time this happened was almost 40 years ago, and it was a great chance to explore all these planets in one go. On August 20th, 1977, thousands of people gathered outside NASA's Kennedy Space Center. They came to witness the launch of the most ambitious and distant space mission in history. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition! Launch rocket Titan took off from Earth and left the atmosphere. As soon as the rocket reached outer space, it launched the probe Voyager 2, which began its journey. The probe consisted of a bus 1.5 feet in height and almost 6 feet wide. On top of it, there was a round 12-foot wide antenna. Most of the scientific equipment was mounted on a boom that extended 8 feet outward. On September 5, 1977, Voyager 1, the identical space probe, left our home planet. It sent us pictures of Earth and the Moon. It soon overtook Voyager 2, launched two weeks earlier. That's why the second probe has the number 1 in its name. And so the journey through dark space began. March 5, 1979. About four Earth-Sun distances away from our planet, Voyager 1 came close to Jupiter and prepared its scientific equipment to explore the planet. The probe had a dozen gadgets, including a two-camera system with narrow and wide-angle lenses. So, it could take full-length photos of the planet with the wide-angle camera, as well as close-up photos of specific places on the planet and its satellites. The probe also had a radio science system to determine the atmospheric composition, weight, and gravitational fields of the planets it came across. Infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers could help measure radiation and temperature invisible to the human eye. Various sensors were used to examine cosmic rays. Voyager 1 was the first to find volcanoes outside Earth. Those were on Jupiter's satellite, Io. It has dozens of active volcanoes that constantly spew lava. Then the probe pointed its cameras at the Great Red Spot. That's how people learned that it was a giant cyclone-like storm that hasn't stopped for the entire history of observations of Jupiter. It was also the first time when lightning was detected outside of our home planet. And in the invisible spectrum, Voyager 1 noticed that Io acted like an electrical generator for Jupiter. Ions, which are charged particles, were constantly flying toward the gas giant. This electrical current was 5 million amps. Soon, Voyager 1 continued its journey. Five months later, Voyager 2 approached Jupiter 2. This gas giant has rings around it. They're not like Saturn's, though. Jupiter's rings consist mostly of dust. When the planet's rocky satellites collided, they turned into small debris. Gradually, this debris turned into fine dust. Then Voyager 2 approached Europa. This moon is completely covered by a crust of ice, and beneath it, there may be a liquid ocean where life can possibly exist. Voyager 2 was the first to capture the cracks in Europa's ice crust. While flying near Io, Voyager 2 discovered that six volcanoes on its surface were still erupting. This meant that the periods of activity of these volcanoes could last for months. Both space probes circled the gas giant several times and then dashed further into space. Such a gravitational maneuver allowed them to gain more speed and save fuel for the trip. By November 9, 1980, Voyager 1 had already traveled eight Earth-Sun distances away from home. The space probe arrived at Saturn. It discovered three new satellites of the gas giant, Atlas, Prometheus, and Pandora. This proved the theory that these were the moons that kept the planet's rings in line. It also turned out that unlike Jupiter's, Saturn's rings also contained ice. Voyager 1 took a peek at Titan. 
Saturn's largest satellite. It's 50% larger than the Moon and even has an atmosphere. It's the only place in the solar system besides Earth where liquid water has been proven to exist. That's why scientists don't deny the possibility of life there. Then it was time for another gravity maneuver. Voyager 1 once again darted away from the planet's orbit. This time, it was aiming upward relative to the line of the parade of planets. Almost a year later, Voyager 2 arrived there. It made a flyby of several of Saturn's icy satellites. Supposedly, a long time ago, these moons collided and knocked huge chunks of ice and rock out of each other. This debris orbited Saturn, collided, and slowly crumbled into dust, consisting of ice and rock. This is how the famous rings of Saturn were born. Another gravity maneuver, and Voyager 2 set off for the next gas giant. Five years later, it arrived at its destination, 17 Earth-Sun distances away from our planet. For the first time ever, a human-made object approached Uranus. Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons there. The probe also found that Uranus was the coldest planet in the solar system. Its temperature is negative 350 degrees Fahrenheit. That's four times colder than the temperature at the South Pole. At that time, the Deep Space Network was being tested on Earth for the first time. It's a network of radio telescopes all over the planet. They aim at certain points in the sky to establish communication with extremely distant objects. These telescopes have been successfully receiving signals from Voyagers 1 and 2. August 25, 1989. Voyager 2 had already traveled 23 Earth-Sun distances and arrived at Neptune. It was the first time people received images of this blue planet from such a close distance. The probe discovered six new moons there and also took the first pictures of the planet's rings. Engineers then turned off the probe's cameras to save power for its main computer and the instruments that measured the solar and interstellar wind. Voyager 2 left Neptune and headed into deep space. That's why it no longer needed the cameras. A few months later, Voyager 1 sent its last photo back to Earth. It was a family portrait of our entire solar system. Every pale dot was a planet. You can barely recognize Earth in the picture. After that, the camera was turned off to save power. This was the start of the interstellar mission for Voyager 1. For 15 years, Voyager 1 had been flying to the edge of the solar system. On December 16, 2004, the probe passed through the termination shock. This is where the solar wind suddenly slows down and heats up after colliding with the interstellar wind. The space probe managed to endure this test and continued its journey. In 2007, Voyager 2 crossed the same boundary. At that point, sensors recorded a temperature of about 266 degrees Fahrenheit, but the probe managed to withstand it and continued its journey through the dark cosmos. Both Voyagers moved through interstellar space in different directions. They discovered that the heliosphere, the solar wind bubble, is not perfectly round, but more like an egg. August 25, 2012. Voyager 1 became the first human-made object to enter interstellar space. It's now also the most distant artificial object in human history. On November 5, 2018, Voyager 2 also left the solar system. The two probes continued their journey into deep space. Right now, the Voyagers have been operational for 44 years. Voyager 1 has traveled 153 Earth-Sun distances and is moving forward at 38,000 miles per hour. In about 300 years, the probes will reach the Oort Cloud. This is a hypothetical region around the solar system with nothing but asteroids and blocks of ice. Scientists believe they might reach the nearest stars in the next 40,000 years. Perhaps one day, the Voyagers will enter these star systems and explore unknown worlds. There may be planets there that look like ours. The probes may even be able to find an intelligent civilization there. For this purpose, each Voyager carries a golden record with a message on it. There are 115 images. Among them, there's our number systems, a map of the solar system and pictures of its planets, diagrams of human DNA, portraits of people, and landscapes from Earth. There's also greetings in 55 of Earth's languages, including the oldest and newest of them. There are also 90 minutes of music from every corner of our planet. The Voyagers also carry a device to play these sounds. If another civilization gets this record, their scientists could decode the data step by step. And then, that civilization may decide to pay us a friendly visit. They'll have to repeat the heroic journey of the Voyagers, though. Dozens of light years through dark space. 
then crossing the border of the solar system, and finally flying past Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the asteroid belt toward the little blue planet. We can only hope that people will be advanced enough to welcome them. Recently, Voyager 1, a space probe designed to study the outer solar system and interstellar space, started sending truly bizarre messages to Earth. It was impossible to decipher them. Scientists were perplexed. Were extraterrestrial civilizations trying to tell us something? It turned out not to be the case. Apparently, the spaceship has encountered serious problems on its space voyage. Currently, NASA is trying to reach across 15 billion miles to rescue the probe. Unfortunately, spacecraft can't live forever. Last year, Voyager 1 started beaming home total nonsense. And if before, it was a string of binary code consisting of ones and zeros, now it's something unintelligible. It means that billions of miles away from home, beyond the protective bubble surrounding the solar system, Voyager 1 is in big trouble. The Voyager 1 team on Earth traced the problem to the probe's flight data system. It's an onboard computer parsing and parceling all kinds of science measurements for further radio transmittal to Earth. One theory claims that it could have been struck by a high-energy cosmic particle, which caused problems with the system's memory, like a bit flip. Bit flips occur when you're copying data, and one of the bits changes, making everything incorrect. A value of 1 becomes a 0, or vice versa. Usually the team simply asked the spacecraft for a memory readout. It allowed them to find and reset the errant bit. But this time, they don't know where the bit flip is because they can't see what the probe's memory is. And it's the most serious issue they've had in a long time. It's very worrying because they've lost communication with the spacecraft. But recently, the team has managed to break through to Voyager 1. After months of stress and failed attempts, they finally managed to decode a portion of the spacecraft's gibberish. This might allow them to find a way to decipher whatever it's trying to say. While you're watching this video, Voyager 1 has already traveled around 10,000 miles of almost empty space. Voyager 1 and its sibling, Voyager 2, are slipping away from us at incredible speeds. Sooner or later, they're bound to fall silent. The Voyagers are very important to humanity, as much as they're beloved. The Voyager missions were supposed to exploit a once-in-175-year alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to slingshot through our solar system, exploring its most distant regions. Outfitted with nuclear power sources, these space probes were built to last. Nearly half a century later, the probes are still the farthest flung and longest-lived missions ever sent into the cosmos by people. Voyager 1 is the front-runner, and its sibling is trailing close behind. In the years 1979 to 1981, the Voyagers zipped by the gas giants of our solar system, sending stunning images of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as their collection of moons, to Earth. Voyager 2 then went on to explore the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Those were actually the first and so far only times people had seen those bluish worlds up close. After that, the Voyagers left the realm of the known planets. Each of them followed its own path into darkness. Voyager 1 moved up and out of the plane of the solar system, while Voyager 2 looped downward. As the Voyagers traveled farther from Earth, the team switched off many onboard instruments, including the cameras. But the spacecraft kept studying the space they were flying through. Their main task was to examine the heliosphere, that protective bubble around our solar system formed by the sun's wind and magnetic field. It blocks cosmic rays, protecting us from space radiation. The Voyagers were supposed to document the unfamiliar mix of particles and fields, escape the solar system, and turn into real interstellar wanderers. It happened in 2012. Voyager 1 crossed the boundary where the sun's influence waned. And if before, we could only make guesses about what was beyond that barrier and how it shielded Earth from the harshness of the cosmos. Now, Voyager 1 could tell us directly about the stuff filling space between stars. Voyager 2 followed its sibling in 2018. 
Thousands of strange spaceships sneak into Earth's airspace. They descend to our planet and fly through cities, plunging people into complete chaos. Suddenly, the door of the largest ship opens, and a strange creature comes out. It tries to copy our language and says they had come from a distant star Proxima Centauri. Something like this might happen because scientists have recently picked up a strange radio signal off that star. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system. It's only 4.2 light years away. That means a beam of light that starts from this star reaches Earth in 4.2 years. That's also 270,000 distances from Earth to the Sun. The star Proxima Centauri itself is too pale for us to see with the unaided eye in the night sky. But its system hides a little secret. Let's fly there and take a closer look. So here's this red dwarf. It's seven times smaller than our sun and eight times lighter. Proxima Centauri is 1.5 times bigger than Jupiter and almost 150 times heavier. But what we're looking for is a little further away. This is Proxima Centauri b, a planet similar to Earth. It's only 10% larger than Earth and is in the habitable zone of the star. It's the perfect distance, not too far away and not too close. So the temperature isn't too high or low there either. Water, if it exists on that planet, can be in a liquid state. And so, life can survive and evolve there. Maybe it's developed enough to send us the signal that we had received. A radio signal is basically waves. They have a certain frequency and length, and we can always tell an artificial signal from a naturally generated one. The signal that we picked up from Proxima Centauri B had a frequency of 982 megahertz. The regular radio we listen to in the kitchen or in the car picks up signals around 100 megahertz. That's why scientists have concluded that the signal was created artificially. Such signals could have a way of communication between the developed worlds. If this is really a message from an outer space civilian, we should be able to decode it. For this, any civilization must use the simplest method of encryption. For example, Earth has already sent a radio signal into space. It was the Arecibo message. This message consists of 1,679 digits. It's a rectangle of 23 by 73 squares that has information about our civilization encoded using a binary code. At the top of the rectangle, there's a system of numbers that we use. They're marked in white. This purple thing is the key to read the next part of the message. The atomic numbers of the elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus are encoded in this key. These are the key elements that can start life. If those who receive this signal can make sense of the numbers in the key, they can read the next part of the message. These green things are the building blocks of our DNA chain. And right at the bottom here is the DNA chain itself. The white rectangle indicates the number of pairs of these building blocks, and the blue spirals show the shape of a DNA chain. And then we see the human silhouette itself. The white and blue object to its left is a coded number of our average height. The human itself is drawn here at the ends of the DNA strand so that the outer space civilization can understand what we look like. And the white rectangle to the right of the human sketch is the number of Earth's population at the time of the message. That's 4.2 billion as of 1974, almost half the number we have now. The next part is a drawing of our solar system. The big yellow square is the sun. Then come all the planets in our solar system, including Pluto. Earth is shifted up a bit here so that outer space civilization can understand where this message is coming from. In the last drawing is the observatory from which this message had been sent into space. This signal is now on its way to the M13 star cluster 25,000 light years away from Earth. So it won't get there for another 25,000 years. And we'll need another 25 to get a response if there is really someone on the other side who can receive the signal. If the signal from Proxima Centauri is also a message, we'll need time to decode it. So let's fire up our super-powered computing machine and wait for the result. But this isn't the first mystery signal we've ever picked up on Earth. Scientists recorded an unusual WOW signal in 1977. They supposed it came from somewhere in the constellation of Sagittarius. The telescope was picking up the unknown signal for an impressive 72 seconds. Later, a scientist who looked at the printout of the signal concluded that the signal was artificial. He wrote, WOW! on the printout as his reaction. The following observations and studies couldn't catch this signal again. Some theories said that this signal came from a celestial spaceship flying by. It had flown away, and we could no longer detect the signal. But most likely, this signal was created on Earth. 
It was directed upward but reflected off an object at a high altitude. It could have been an airplane, a satellite, or space debris orbiting our planet. Then the signal was picked up by the telescope, and because it was human-made, all of its characteristics, like wavelength and frequency, could have confused scientists. In 2017, scientists recorded a flare on Proxima Centauri. The star's brightness increased by 1,000 times in just 10 seconds. Before that, there was another flare there that was weaker but lasted about two minutes. With these flares, Proxima Centauri has emitted enormous amounts of radiation. Even if there was life on the star's companion planet, these flares would have likely destroyed it. The stellar winds would have simply blown the atmosphere off the planet and made its surface lifeless. Overall, the planet Proxima Centauri b receives 60 times more high-energy radiation and 400 times more X-ray radiation than Earth. Scientists have concluded that the probability of life here is 1 to 100 million. And while we don't know yet for sure if the signal was artificial or natural, the scenario of a bunch of spaceships coming to Earth is most likely possible. Our only method for searching for outer space civilizations is using radio waves. They're like loud noise that blasts away from our planet in different directions at the speed of light. The main problem here is the gigantic distances. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide. Suppose there's life at the other end of it. If we send a radio signal to them, it won't reach that supposed planet for another 100,000 years. And we won't get a response for another 100,000 years. It's the same if someone once wanted to contact us. We didn't learn how to create and receive radio signals until the 19th century. If a civilization was developing at the same time as us somewhere in the Milky Way and they invented the radio, we won't get their signal for several millennia. Plus, the radio noise from our planet is starting to fade away. We use Bluetooth, fiber optics, cable TV. So in about 100 years, we'll no longer be visible to other worlds. Or worse, what if there was an outer space civilization somewhere that was sending signals into space? The signals were reaching our planet, but we didn't yet have the technology to pick them up. The world that was sending the signal has evolved, and the signal went out. We could have caught those remnants of the radio waves that were moving through the universe, but we set up the antennas too late. There are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. Each of them contains billions and trillions of stars similar to our sun. Maybe there's a planet near one of them that looks like ours. Life could be blooming there. In this outer space civilization, just like us, is looking through telescopes in hopes to catch the radio signal from an unknown planet. Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020, and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. 
if you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still, Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy, 
Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart. But, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns. But the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe. At least, that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige. Or, as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds. And it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there because you grow up to 2 inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For six feet, it's about two extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. All the planets of the solar system are slowly lining up. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune are about to form a straight line. This event, called the Parade of Planets, occurs once every 176 years. The last time this happened was almost 40 years ago, and it was a great chance to explore all these planets in one go. On August 20th, 1977, thousands of people gathered outside NASA's Kennedy Space Center. They came to witness the launch of the most ambitious and distant space mission in history. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition! Launch rocket Titan took off from Earth and left the atmosphere. As soon as the rocket reached outer space, it launched the probe Voyager 2, which began its journey. The probe consisted of a bus 1.5 feet in height and almost 6 feet wide. On top of it, there was a round 12-foot wide antenna. Most of the scientific equipment was mounted on a boom that extended 8 feet outward. On September 5, 1977, Voyager 1, the identical space probe, left our home planet. It sent us pictures of Earth and the Moon. It soon overtook Voyager 2, launched two weeks earlier. That's why the second probe has the number 1 in its name. And so the journey through dark space began. March 5, 1979, about four Earth-Sun distances away from our planet, Voyager 1 came close to Jupiter and prepared its scientific equipment to explore the planet. The probe had a dozen gadgets, including a two-camera system with narrow and wide-angle lenses, so it could take full-length photos of the planet with the wide-angle camera, as well as close-up photos of specific places on the planet and its satellites. The probe also had a radio science system to determine the atmospheric composition, weight, and gravitational fields of the planets it came across. Infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers could help measure radiation and temperature invisible to the human eye. Various sensors were used to examine cosmic rays. Voyager 1 was the first to find volcanoes outside Earth. 
those were on Jupiter's satellite, Io. It has dozens of active volcanoes that constantly spew lava. Then the probe pointed its cameras at the Great Red Spot. That's how people learned that it was a giant cyclone-like storm that hasn't stopped for the entire history of observations of Jupiter. It was also the first time when lightning was detected outside of our home planet. And in the invisible spectrum, Voyager 1 noticed that Io acted like an electrical generator for Jupiter. Ions, which are charged particles, were constantly flying toward the gas giant. This electrical current was 5 million amps. Soon, Voyager 1 continued its journey. Five months later, Voyager 2 approached Jupiter 2. This gas giant has rings around it. They're not like Saturn's, though. Jupiter's rings consist mostly of dust. When the planet's rocky satellites collided, they turned into small debris. Gradually, this debris turned into fine dust. Then Voyager 2 approached Europa. This moon is completely covered by a crust of ice, and beneath it, there may be a liquid ocean where life can possibly exist. Voyager 2 was the first to capture the cracks in Europa's ice crust. While flying near Io, Voyager 2 discovered that six volcanoes on its surface were still erupting. This meant that the periods of activity of these volcanoes could last for months. Both space probes circled the gas giant several times and then dashed further into space. Such a gravitational maneuver allowed them to gain more speed and save fuel for the trip. By November 9, 1980, Voyager 1 had already traveled eight Earth-Sun distances away from home. The space probe arrived at Saturn. It discovered three new satellites of the gas giant, Atlas, Prometheus, and Pandora. This proved the theory that these were the moons that kept the planet's rings in line. It also turned out that unlike Jupiter's, Saturn's rings also contained ice. Voyager 1 took a peek at Titan, Saturn's largest satellite. It's 50% larger than the moon and even has an atmosphere. It's the only place in the solar system besides Earth where liquid water has been proven to exist. That's why scientists don't deny the possibility of life there. Then it was time for another gravity maneuver. Voyager 1 once again darted away from the planet's orbit. This time, it was aiming upward relative to the line of the parade of planets. Almost a year later, Voyager 2 arrived there. It made a flyby of several of Saturn's icy satellites. Supposedly, a long time ago, these moons collided and knocked huge chunks of ice and rock out of each other. This debris orbited Saturn, collided, and slowly crumbled into dust, consisting of ice and rock. This is how the famous rings of Saturn were born. Another gravity maneuver, and Voyager 2 set off for the next gas giant. Five years later, it arrived at its destination, 17 Earth-Sun distances away from our planet. For the first time ever, a human-made object approached Uranus. Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons there. The probe also found that Uranus was the coldest planet in the solar system. Its temperature is negative 350 degrees Fahrenheit. That's four times colder than the temperature at the South Pole. At that time, the Deep Space Network was being tested on Earth for the first time. It's a network of radio telescopes all over the planet. They aim at certain points in the sky to establish communication with extremely distant objects. These telescopes have been successfully receiving signals from Voyagers 1 and 2. August 25, 1989. Voyager 2 had already traveled 23 Earth-Sun distances and arrived at Neptune. It was the first time people received images of this blue planet from such a close distance. The probe discovered six new moons there and also took the first pictures of the planet's rings. Engineers then turned off the probe's cameras to save power for its main computer and the instruments that measured the solar and interstellar wind. Voyager 2 left Neptune and headed into deep space. That's why it no longer needed the cameras. A few months later, Voyager 1 sent its last photo back to Earth. It was a family portrait of our entire solar system. Every pale dot was a planet. You can barely recognize Earth in the picture. After that, the camera was turned off to save power. This was the start of the interstellar mission for Voyager 1. For 15 years, Voyager 1 had been flying to the edge of the solar system. On December 16, 2004, the probe passed through the termination shock. This is where the solar wind suddenly slows down and heats up after colliding with the interstellar wind. The space probe managed to endure this test and continued its journey. In 2007, Voyager 2 crossed the same boundary. At that point, 
Sensors recorded a temperature of about 266 degrees Fahrenheit, but the probe managed to withstand it and continued its journey through the dark cosmos. Both voyagers moved through interstellar space in different directions. They discovered that the heliosphere, the solar wind bubble, is not perfectly round, but more like an egg. August 25, 2012. Voyager 1 became the first human-made object to enter interstellar space. It's now also the most distant artificial object in human history. On November 5, 2018, Voyager 2 also left the solar system. The two probes continued their journey into deep space. Right now, the Voyagers have been operational for 44 years. Voyager 1 has traveled 153 Earth-Sun distances and is moving forward at 38,000 miles per hour. In about 300 years, the probes will reach the Oort Cloud. This is a hypothetical region around the solar system with nothing but asteroids and blocks of ice. Scientists believe they might reach the nearest stars in the next 40,000 years. Perhaps one day, the Voyagers will enter these star systems and explore unknown worlds. There may be planets there that look like ours. The probes may even be able to find an intelligent civilization there. For this purpose, each Voyager carries a golden record with a message on it. There are 115 images. Among them, there's our number systems, a map of the solar system and pictures of its planets, diagrams of human DNA, portraits of people, and landscapes from Earth. There's also greetings in 55 of Earth's languages, including the oldest and newest of them. There are also 90 minutes of music from every corner of our planet. The Voyagers also carry a device to play these sounds. If another civilization gets this record, their scientists could decode the data step by step. And then, that civilization may decide to pay us a friendly visit. They'll have to repeat the heroic journey of the Voyagers, though. Dozens of light years through dark space. Then, crossing the border of the solar system, and finally, flying past Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the asteroid belt toward the little blue planet. We can only hope that people will be advanced enough to welcome them.